year, everybody. Welcome back to another edition, the first 2023 edition of the Clearing the Crease podcast, powered by Bodog. My name is James Sabalski. With me, as always, a couple of guys who are always known for breaking New Year's resolutions within the first hour of the new year. He is the Calder Trophy winner, Andrew Raycroft. He is the Stanley Cup winner, Mike Commodore. Razor, happy New Year, buddy! Are you uh, you just re- you just got back from the, the the outdoor game, the Winter Classic? How was it? It was great. Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, good to see you guys again here in 2023. It's it's crazy to imagine that is the year that we are now abstaining in, uh, at least for a couple of days. Abstaining, I'm assuming, uh, it won't last until January 15th, but no. we'll try. Uh, it was a good day. Winter Classic was it was a perfect weather day. It was cloudy. Weather was great. People were out all day long. Um, so, again, I know we're going to get to it, but but a solid day for the NHL. No question. And Gary Bettman again. Absolutely. Kami, uh, happy Gary. new year to you, sir. How, uh, happy how did new you year. In the new year. Uh, uh, you know what? I rang in the new year. I went over uh, stayed in Calgary. I went over to a buddy's house and we put some money on the, uh, well, we watched the college football games there, the semifinals. Yeah. Uh, How great good were those? By the way. Oh my God. Uh, all the, oh, the games were unreal. Yeah. yeah. I learned a lesson that day. I, I went over to <laughs> a guy, he, he works for the stamps. He's the D coordinator. Great guy. Obviously knows football. I think I'm starting to realize that like when you want to bet the game, it, I don't know if it's a great idea to ask people that are actually in the game that are like, yeah, cause They tend to go with, yeah, this team, Michigan's awesome. They're the better team, you know, and because they have the better players or whatever, whatever the football terms are. Yeah. So anyways, I ended up taking Michigan and Georgia and got smoked on both of those. (laughs) And uh, so I decided to try my hand at hockey. Mm -hmm. Uh, My girlfriend and I went over to the Canucks Flames for New Mm -hmm. Year's Eve. Nice. And I decided to try and make it all back on my Calgary Flames. And uh, the over, and they won three two. <laughs> I was just gonna, I was gonna say, you're, you're yeah. going over here. Uh, uh. And I took them plus two too. They needed to win by. They two. need that so empty. That, just that empty praying netter, for an empty uh, netter. So in this particular case, can I goaltending like letting left. you down as it actually shows Big up time. for a rare uh, moment in 2023? Uh, I hey, was we got a fun. Happy. <laughs> hey, speaking of Canucks and Flames, we actually have a former Canuck and Flame joining us uh, in uh, a short little while, Todd Bertuzzi, probably better defined as a Vancouver Canuck, but yes, a one-time Calgary Flame. Uh, hey, and don't forget that the Clearing the Crease podcast is brought to you by Bodog, and if you're looking for a sports book in your NHL in-season action, look no further than Bodog, because at Bodog, new customers can get a $400 welcome bonus when you sign up to play today. Bodog offers props on on quite literally anything from same game parlays, goal score picks, all the way down to number of scraps in a game. And if you're listening, watching this, uh, and you're an existing Bodog player, fear not because you can still get in on the bonus action. That's because all players get a $300 match bonus when you deposit with Bitcoin for the very first time. Link in the bio of wherever you are watching, listening to this. And don't forget, Bodog also home for all your UFC action, all fights, props, odds, live odds, get into the octagon courtesy of Bodog. All right, let's get into it here, gentlemen. It's 2023, and uh, here we go. I mean, it is a fresh sheet of ice for a lot of people. It's a clean slate. It's a new year, new optimism. I mean, hey, look at Jake DeBrus when he was doing the outdoor game the other night, right? I mean, who would have predicted this a year ago? But we can get into that in a moment. But guys, I want to start with looking ahead to 2023. What are you most curious about for the, from a hockey standpoint coming into this year? Kami, I'll start with you. What are you anticipating or what are you most intrigued about? Yeah, there's a couple things. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm well, because I'm up in Canada, I am, I'm interested to see how the, if the Leafs can keep this going in 2023. And what I mean by keep it going, I mean, keep it going defensively. I know they're going to score some goals. We've touched on this already, but they're mm-hmm. playing well. And uh, I want to see if that continues. Um, another thing, as, well, I know we're going to touch on this a little later, but it's going to be interesting to see how hard teams tank for that Connor Bedard because he is setting the world on fire. On fire. Um, I don't think my Canes, the Commie Cup is looking not – I don't think my Carolina Hurricanes are going to lose <laughs> another game all year. <laughs> I think it's over. Canes win. <laughs> they are on fire. So we'll see how they do in the new year. Um, 
Yeah, I guess that's about it. There's there's a lot of storylines, obviously, Ovechkin, but I'm jumping around. But I guess two big ones for me were the Canes and the Leafs and Bedard. I mean, well, I mean, here we are in 2023, and guys, like, this spring marks the 30th anniversary since the last time a Canadian team won a Stanley Cup. Like, I mean, I was 18 at the time. I mean, it's crazy to think, like, we have gone 30 years, right? Like, People that are in their 30s do not remember a Canadian team winning a Stanley Cup, which is absolutely bananas, Razor. It is bananas, and and that would no question be the story of Canada if any of these teams were able to find their way through. The Toronto Maple Leafs are certainly the most intriguing. Uh, Can they run the Eastern Gauntlet? If season ends now, they play the Tampa Bay Lightning in the first round. Oh, they play geez. the Boston Bruins in the second round. Oh. They play the Carolina Hurricanes oh. in the third round. And then they get Colorado in the fourth. So uh, that is uh, quite the gauntlet that this team's going to have to go through. Because I don't see, I mean, again, I watch Boston every night. They're 10 points up with them on them in a half a season. I don't know how the Bruins relinquish this. 10 point lead on Not first happening. and first is going to be so important in this division because again, you're looking Toronto, Tampa second, first round right out of the gates. And it just makes it exponentially harder to go through. So the Leafs is a great story. I had Ovi. Ovi's right up there for me. How many goals is he going to score in this calendar year? If he can score, if he scores another 30, 35, 40 goals in this calendar year, you know, my son said the other day, he might get this by the end of next year. Yeah. It, he might get Wayner at the end of next year, the way things are going. I know it's very, you know, looking ahead probably too far, but Ovi's a, a fascinating story to me and how quickly he can break this goal record. And then finally is, and and I it's probably more recent biasy, but it's also because I haven't seen him play. I've heard all about it, but watching Connor Bernard this week on the NHL Network, watching World Juniors, I know that it doesn't always translate but any of these young guys all the way through history, all the way back to the Big E who dominated in this tournament, went on to have dominant careers. And the way this kid's playing, the way he's on another level, it'll be fascinating to see, to Kami's point, who tanks. Because it's coming now. Like You you might really oh. start tanking now if you're one of these teams. Like Get oh, all the way yeah. to the bottom. And then what does he... Can he translate and can he transform a franchise as quickly as Sidney Crosby did, as quickly as Connor McDavid did, and and what that will mean to the NHL to add another one of these superstar type kids to the league? Uh, you know, if and if you look at this in the last twenty years, right, or if you even want to go the last thirty years, you know, Eric Lindros was on the radar for years yeah. before he ultimately got drafted, right? Yeah. Sidney yeah. Crosby was on the radar. Long before he got drafted, you know, I remember Wayne Gretzky and, and you think of Wayne Gretzky and the pressure that he was under as a kid. So he would know But Gretzky. I think when Sid was 15, I think 99 said, he goes, this kid might break all my records. Right. And Sid has certainly lived up to that hype. Lindros yep. barring injuries. I mean, Eric Lindros was still the most dominant player in the game for a brief period of time. You look at Connor McDavid. The hype we saw around Connor McDavid from the time he was 15 and for three years before he gets drafted, living up to the hype. And here we are talking about Connor Bedard. I mean, I went to see Connor Bedard, you know, playing a game in North Delta, British Columbia, going back three years ago. Now he was 14 at the time and he's playing against kids that are 16, 17, and he was still noticeable then. I mean, I, I think, believe the hype. I mean, he is the real deal. It's just a question of how good and where he ultimately lands, Kami. And I think your point, like, all I was thinking last night after he scored that goal was that gift from Rocky IV when Apollo Creed's getting absolutely <laughs> clobbered by Do by uh, Ivan Drago and his cornerman's going, throw in the damn towel! I'm just thinking every general manager right now is going, throw in the damn towel! We're tanking for Bedard! Enough of this crap! We ain't going to no middle around! We are scorched earth! Let's do it! We're tanking! It might not be a bad idea. I have a couple thoughts on it. One, like I'd say like about a month ago. So I've seen Bedard play a little bit just on TV. Yeah. He plays for the Regina Pats. My dad has scouted for the Regina Pats for years, just like Bantam draft stuff, you know. So anyways, my dad sent me a message uh, probably like a month ago, something like that, six weeks ago. 
And he goes, I, hey, do you know how tall, how big was Ray Whitney when he was in junior? And I'm like, fuck, I have no idea, but I'll ask Ray. So <laughs> Ray comes back with whatever he was. He was like, he was pretty small. Five and nine, Ray maybe? dominated yeah. junior. Yeah, he was small. And I think, and I'm like, why do you ask? He's like, well, some of these scouts here are thinking this, you know, Bedard might be too small. I'm like, too small. I'm like, I've just seen a little bit of this guy. He looks just fine to me. But now when you watch the world juniors, I'm like laughing at these comments. I'm like, this isn't going to translate. Like, you never know, to your point, right? You, 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 you don't ever know, no. But, I mean, this kid looks great. And so that was one thing that came to mind. And then the other thing, it might be a little bit too early for this, but and when you talk about Lindros, it kind of it kind of rings my bell a little bit. I mean, what happens if you had that number one pick and traded it? Connor Young Bedard is could... not getting traded. There is there well, is know, no fucking I know, way I know, but he's getting traded. When it comes traded. up, I'm not saying he is. I'm definitely not saying he is, but I'm like, <laughs> you know, what if something happened a la Lindros a little bit? I mean, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but like what kind of haul could you get for him? But anyways, like watching him has been, you know, I, I'll say this is probably – you know, I watch the world juniors, but I'm not one of those people that like, you know, die hard, go out of my way, stop my day. But this world juniors, I've actually like kind of made a point. I'm like, man, I'm, I want to watch some of this and it, it, it's exciting. And the kid seems like he's got a good head on his shoulders and he's got a little fire to him too. That's yeah. one thing like yesterday in that Slovak, you know, he was, was a little bit of the fuck you to that Slovak kid. And like, he's got a little snap to him. So yeah, it's, it, it's exciting for sure. Well, I mean, watch. I had zero desire to watch. When you look at the scores of those quarterfinal games of the World Juniors, yeah. and, you know, I struggle with the World Juniors sometimes. Like, I covered it for years and years, and I, I get, hey, it's great to watch international hockey, but, you know, it is so one-sided. And, and I feel like these days the tournament is so skewed towards Canada, you know, in the sense that the uh, the International Ice Hockey Federation sees obviously the financial value where you've got these packed Canadian arenas. So, but it's like home ice advantage for Canada, which is already the dominant team, already loaded with a dozen first round picks pretty much every year for that team. I had zero to I just assumed it was going to be another 11 1 game. And here it was, you know, tied at three all through that third period before, you know, you get to overtime and, and the Bedard show. And, and I mean, that's a defining goal, right? I mean, that is a that is a legacy goal that people will talk about. Um, just how he did that in that moment. By the way, horrible clearing attempt by the Slovak defenseman on that yeah. on that goal. Oops. But oops, yeah, no yeah. kidding. But uh, but I mean, what a story. Um, I, I mean, I feel for the Slovakian players just because. I mean, what a show by the keeper. Um, oh, he was so good, right? Oh I mean, fifty plus saves. Oh. I mean, just incredible. But. I mean, if there was any sort of reminder that Connor Bedard is going first overall, um, now, Kami, you're you're absolutely spot on. Oh, I mean, he looks yeah. like the real going deal, and then some. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, the that, prospects yeah. game coming up in a few weeks here in Vancouver, and and that is, I mean, he's been selling out arenas all across the Western League this year too, yeah. right? Like that's the other thing. What you know, attendance has been through the roof in the Western League whenever he comes to town. It's amazing. Yeah, it is amazing for sure. And and that game was a great game. I watched the entire game and, you know, they got off to a lead and in those, you know, those dirty Slovaks, they hang in there and they make some good plays, some breakdowns. And, and then that, you know, they had that Canada had that power play, which it was a cross check, but it was kind of, you know, I didn't love to see that, but whatever. I thought they were in trouble and they killed it off and Canada's hitting a million posts. And I'm like, man, this could be a game. The Slovaks, you know, they find a way to win. I was laughing in overtime because that the goalie, I don't even know his last name. I should. Plays in the USHL. He made a big save on Bedard again. I mean, I think Bedard had like seven or eight shots in overtime or something. And you could see like his body language. Like he made a great save. It was a right pad save. Yeah. And you could see him like getting up. And he was like kind of, I mean, the kid was exhausted. Like he was... Anyways, he played awesome. I literally laughed out loud because I'm like, this guy is playing his ass off. <laughs> um, but it, it was a great game. I, I thought it was very entertaining. I know, you know, Canada shot him big time, but I, I know the Slovaks are obviously disappointed and, you know, tears and everything. And that's part of the reason why people watch World Juniors is because it's kids and raw emotion and all that. But they should be proud of themselves. I thought they played great. Ray, Razor, just to that point, what Kami's talking about, how exhausting that is. What, what's the most What's the most amount of saves you made in a game? Oh. 
Uh, in juniors, I 17, had a few. 17, 18. <laughs> that was, that was, that was, that was what I, right before I got yanked after giving up four. Yeah, exactly. 17, but, but, but 17 on 15 minutes. No, my last year juniors, we were, I was, I had a, t- had a few 60 nighters, few 65, 60. 70 nighters in those old, oh. the old London night barn, right? Jesus. Like the old small barns in Ontario that you, you'd get. And what's that with. like? Like how exhausting well, is that? It, it gets, yeah, it gets to the point where pucks are just hitting you. I think the guys get just as tired shooting it at, at that point. I don't think Bedard was tired shooting it, but to, <laughs> to Kami's point, like that body language of just, you're grinding only on the shot. Everything else is irrelevant. You're just trying to get back to your feet but you you also get into a mode where it just it just happens and pucks are hitting you and you're getting you're you're doing nothing almost so it's better there's a lot of times where goalies overplay everything but you get to that point of fatigue where you're just kind of cruising in the middle of the net and someone's got to make a great play like Bedard did to beat you because everything's you're just staying right in position not even on not even um mentally thinking that way you're not trying you just are because you're so tired so it just becomes reactionary more than anything, uh, man. That's yeah. Uh, what a performance though. I mean, it, it becomes awesome. the stuff of legends. My favorite Slovakia story, by the way, driving through Europe, uh, after the world hockey championship in 2005, we get to Slovakia and a customs official asked to see my passport. I was born in Ottawa originally. So looks at my passport, sees, you know, birthplace, Ottawa kind of has this scowl on his face. And then he all of a sudden smiles and says, Marion Hossa, Zdeno Chara. <laughs> there we go. Hockey's <laughs> oh, you know, drive into the night. So, um, hey, listen, the big thing, uh, I'll tell you what, for 2023, thing I'm looking ho- ahead to, possible trades with the rock stars that are out there. I mean, the talk of Patrick Kane, you know, Eric Carlson's obviously pulled an undertaker and sat up off the canvas. Uh, he's alive and kicking again. Uh, the talk about Bo, Bo Horvat, the captain in Vancouver as well. I'd just be curious. Horvat obviously feels like a more manageable trade, but you're talking about players who can help make a major difference with Eric Carlson and Patrick Kane. And can teams pull this off? Because it's enticing to, for us to talk about it, but can these deals actually happen? I'm fascinated because there's clearly gas still left in the tank for, I mean, Horvat's having a career season. He's going to get paid wherever he winds up landing. But with Kane, with Carlson. I mean, there's some sexy names out there as we are less than two months away from the NHL trade deadline. Yeah, and, and the arms race. We we just touched on the four teams in the Eastern Conference. Yeah. The Tampa, the Toronto, the Boston, the Carolina. They all are in. They all want to win this thing now. Um, and what they're willing to give up and who's going to make the first deal to let the domino set in place. Jonathan Taze, another guy. Uh, and then on top of the free agents that are out there this year. This free agent class is something else. So, but yeah, the, the 2023 arms race at the deadline is going to be fascinating to see what teams can pull off the financial gymnastics to put themselves underneath the cap long enough. Who's going to pull the long-term injury reserve thing here in the next couple of weeks to get their guy through the, the playoffs. It'll be interesting and it's going to be dirty. It's going to be dirty pool because <laughs> there's five or six teams that want these guys and not enough to go around. And it's really what's going to put teams over the edge. We've seen it the last couple of years. You need the horses to get to and, the and, and Razor, a lot of these teams, these veteran teams, right? Carolina's window is now. The Leafs, obviously, they've run it back. They're now. Boston, hey, look, I mean, this is, you know, with an aging core, you know, now is the time. All these teams, Tampa, you're going for it one more time. So I can't, it's hard not to think, Tommy, that everybody's pushing their chips in here when we're talking about these usual suspects. Yeah, I would think so. All those teams you guys just talked about. And and yeah, like it, it is fun to always, you know, think about and talk about these trades and what's going to happen, but like actually pulling them off and what you're going to give up. And like you said, the financial end that goes with it. Tampa's another team that we don't, we, we barely talked about Tampa and they've been in the finals the last three years. I mean, and, and they're not really letting up either. So yeah, it's going to be interesting. The one for me is, is definitely Patrick Kane. I'm, I'm going to be That'll be the real interesting one for me, especially, I mean, Chicago is going to be putting her on full tank mode. They are already, (laughs) but I mean, if there was any, I mean, they are going to be emptying the tank. So um, yeah, it it should be, it's going to be interesting. There's a lot of teams that look really, really good. And like you get, like you said, the windows now. Well, I'll tell you what, if Chicago were to land the 
Connor Bedard sweepstakes, would we think that there would be a conspiracy theory? Because speaking of conspiracy theories, the hockey Illuminati is going to join us in a moment. We've talked about frozen envelopes in the NBA for Patrick Ewing and the Knicks going back almost 40 years ago. Does that exist in hockey? The Illuminati weighs in next here on the Clearing the Crease Poet Podcast powered by Bodog. The Clearing the Crease podcast, powered by Bodog, continues. Sabalski, Ray Croft, Commodore, and now we are going to get into some, some conspiracy theories. The hockey yes. Illuminati, Frank Krupe, who I absolutely love following on Instagram. <laughs> love the theories, love his takes. Very passionate with, when it comes to the Toronto Maple Leafs. Frankie, Happy New Year, buddy. Happy New Year, fellas. It's a pleasure to be here with my Bodog bros, and uh, I've got a little bit in common with everybody here. James has been watching you and listening to you for a long, long time. Uh, Razor, you and I are both former goalies, born in the month of May. Your career went a lot further than I did, but we both stopped a few pucks at one point. And uh, Kami, you and I both share a very strong disdain for Mike Babcock. Love you already. It's music (laughs) to my ears. Yes, I hate that guy too. I love to hear it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So we're going to have a giant love fast today for a little bit. Well, hey, uh, listen, so so Frankie, just a few minutes ago, we were talking about Connor Bedard and just how yeah. many teams are probably, you know, suddenly thinking, you know what, screw this uh, battling for a playoff spot. We're tanking, um, you know, let the conspiracy theories begin. But you go back to what, almost 20 years ago when Sidney Crosby was the first overall selection. And as Brian Burke once said, Pittsburgh modeled my ass. They won a goddamn lottery. Was there a conspiracy theory? with Sidney Crosby going to the Penguins all those years ago. Yeah, you know what? Uh, There's a lot of fans that probably don't know this story, some younger fans, but the 2005 entry draft was one of the shadiest things ever go down in the NHL. That was the first time since 1980 that the NHL lottery draft was held behind closed doors, okay? So there was no public drawing of the balls Gary Bettman went in behind a curtain and he came out from behind the curtain holding a Pittsburgh Penguins logo. Oh, look, Penguins, congratulations, you won. The Penguins were a disaster in you know, that era, right, fellas? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they were Big a mess. T- it was no doubt. Terrible. Yeah. Nightmare. Disaster. They almost terrible. moved to Hamilton, right? Remember Jim Ball Silly tried to buy the That's Penguins. That's right. They almost moved Black to Kansas Berry. City. Blackberry, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Who remembers yeah. Blackberry? <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, I wish I had a Ping Blackberry. Me's. Ping me. Yeah. Brick breaker. <laughs> <We'll see. laughs> exactly. And I think they almost moved to Kansas City as well. They were like just mm-hmm. teetering in and out of bankruptcy. Like Mario Lemieux had to unretire. Uh, he had to turn some of his salary into equity to save the franchise. It was a shit show. They couldn't sell tickets. And they magically won the lottery draft to get Crosby, right? So this is what fuels conspiracy theorists, okay? The NHL is a corporation. They're a, they're a multi-billion dollar corporation. They're in the business of making money. Yeah, they care about the fans and they love – the players and grow the game. Well, yeah, it's great. At the end of the day, the owners are heavily invested in protecting their assets and making money. So that's why I think that it is entirely possible that we are going to see the NHL low key fix the lottery draft for the Arizona Coyotes this year to have Bedard go there because let's face it, the Arizona Coyotes are the outcasts of the NHL. They should not be there. You're, you're not going to be, it's an uphill battle to make hockey work in the desert. And this is the type of guy that can save their franchise. I think it's possible. That's what we see. I don't know if I, I don't think, I don't think that's the, I don't think that's the conspiracy. The fix is in for Arizona. To me, the fix is in if it's Chicago. I think the fix is in if it's Vancouver, but the hometown kid going home and considering the Canucks have never won or had the first overall pick. Uh, that's where I could see the frozen envelope if you want to channel your New York Knicks uh, 1985 draft with Patrick Ewing uh, conspiracy. That, I, I don't see Arizona because they've just been terrible for so long. At some point, you're due to, you know, it's like the guy who got struck by lightning in the great outdoors. Six, 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 yeah. 65 or whatever, right? So, can, um, can, we, can we assume... Can we assume that we know for sure the fix isn't in if the Columbus Blue Jackets win the lottery? And when yeah. Connor McDavid, can we assume that it's definitely not fixed if that's the case? Or the yeah. Flyers, right? Imagine the Flyers win. Oh, I, I'll, that I'll, brings up I say this. thoughts. I'm a little, uh, I'm on Frankie's side of this because with the Arizona Coyotes, Gary Bettman has been adamant that they work. I mean, it's been a disaster there. They they banked on the everybody moving out west, out to Glendale. Nobody moved out there. They put that arena there. It was a disaster. Nobody lives there. 
Yep. I do think from living in Arizona that there is a significant amount. I mean, it's there's 6 million people that live in the area, but more importantly, there's a lot of people that go down there from Chicago, from Canada, from hockey areas, especially in the winter. Right now, I just went to two games. It was actually really fun. I had a really good, I mean, I have a good time anywhere, but <laughs> Mullet Arena was actually a pretty good time. But that's not the point. They have they had that vote come in. So I could see, I'm on Frankie's side with this. If it gets voted through where that arena gets approved and that arena is going to be built where now they're back up to, you know, whatever the capacity is, 18,000 people, and they get it built in Tempe, kind of right close to where Mullet Arena is. I could see, like I've always said that, if that arena was in the right place and Tempe's one of the right spots, it's got to be on the east side of the 101, which Tempe is. If the Arizona Coyotes were just a mediocre team, I think that building would be full, three quarters full on a Tuesday night. I think there's that many people there that want to go to games. So yeah. I, I got to say, I'm with Frankie on this one. I could right. see it. I could and, and see you know it. What? Yeah, and and with Bedard there, like there they'll be a mediocre team at at least like in the near future, right? I mean, this guy's a generational talent. Players like like this don't come along every draft, and the NHL is going to be heavily invested, you would think, in making sure this guy goes to the right market to maximize the amount of potential he can bring into the league. Um, especially after what's been a you know a couple down years in the NHL with what we've gone through, they've really struggled. I mean, there's probably 15 cities that you could think of in North America that that should have a team over Arizona. And one of the reasons I think their Coyotes haven't moved and they're still there is because, like, has Bettman's ego gotten in the way a little bit? Well, you know, I'll tell you. Coyotes I'll, have always I'll, been his baby. I'll right? tell you what. Look look at look what just happened, though, a few weeks ago with respect to – because we've often – and look, I've had screaming matches with, you know, Bill Daly and Gary Bettman in years past on various talk shows over – the commitment of keeping a team in Arizona when you're talking about trying to cap players' salaries and you know, you're talking about this and that, and you're going, okay, well, wait a minute. Like you're not really generating a lot of money, but look at the value of that market. Three weeks ago, the NBA's Phoenix Suns sold for four freaking billion. Yeah. Right? That's the Phoenix Suns. You don't necessarily think of them in the same conversation as the LA Lakers, the Boston Celtics, the Knicks those sorts of markets, but the Phoenix suns sold for $4 billion. So when you think about it that way, in terms of a media market and the size, that's where the NHL says, you know, there's, there's something here. We've clearly screwed it up year after year, after year, after year for the better part of the last quarter century, but there's clearly something there for their resolve to be Frankie. I mean, I think your point, like it is remarkable the commitment that the NHL has maintained. And I think a lot of people kind of look in hindsight and going, man, where was that love for Winnipeg in the nineties? Yeah. Where was that love for Quebec city in the nineties? Yeah. Right. And, and look, yeah. the dollar and the economics were completely different at the time, but man, like the resolve that the NHL has shown for the Arizona coyotes should be a blueprint for every other team facing financial challenges and uncertainty for the next hundred years based on what they've done. hundred percent. Well said. And maybe I, maybe I can get a copy of that blueprint to uh, put to use with some of the women that I date, because I can't seem to commit to anybody either. So oh I want to thank you. Yeah, I hear you with that, Frankie. I agree with you there too. I'm in the same boat. <laughs> I got all kinds of issues here too. You're not alone. Well, on that note, Frankie, hey, Hockey Illuminati, where can we find you uh, on social media? Because, uh, I mean, you obviously put a lot of detail and, uh, and a lot of effort. They're entertaining. They're informative. Yeah, they're, awesome. they're also fun. Uh, where can people find you if they haven't found you quite yet? Thanks, guys. I appreciate that. Yeah, so the majority of my content is now living on Instagram and TikTok, at Hockey Illuminati on Instagram, Hockey underscore Illuminati on TikTok. That's where you'll find my most recent, my daily stuff. I've also done a podcast. Uh, I don't record new podcast episodes, but I've recorded probably 30, 35 legacy style interviews with all types of players, uh, which uh, are very, very interesting. And uh, we go in all types of different directions. So you can find me uh, on uh, Spotify, iTunes as well, under Hockey the Mountain. Check out some of my legacy interviews. And uh, yeah, just causing some shit and raising some hell online. Frankie, let's do Perfect. this again sometime. Come back and yeah. visit us. All right? Love it, fellas. Thanks for the time. We'll chat yeah, soon. Right. But our going to Arizona. Thanks, Frankie. I'll be here. Our Ohio. fellow Bodog <laughs> brother, Frank Krupe, the Hockey Illuminati, joining us here on the 
bit. Uh, no, well, no, where we are? We are the Bodogs clearing the crease podcast. Man, it's a new year, but That's clearly right. I'm still in one. Commie, back in a moment. <laughs> this week's special guest on the Clearing the Crease podcast, powered by Bodog. He is a former Vancouver Canuck with maybe a stop in Detroit, in Florida, the Islanders, former Calgary Flame great, mm, uh, right. the Ducks. Did I forget any? No, I think we pretty much tapped every one of them. Todd Bertuzzi, how are you, man? It's been a minute. I'm doing, I'm doing awesome. How are you guys doing? You look good, man. You look like you, you look like you lost weight. Uh, no, I keep in shape. I still work out every day. I uh, unfortunately not employed, uh, so I have time on my hand to work out. And uh, to be honest, I spend a lot of time just chasing my kids around. I got uh, my boy, my girls, my daughters in Boston, my sons in Norfolk, currently up in Charlotte with the Checkers right now. So I just been spending a lot of time traveling, uh, watching the kids. How's tag season going uh, right now? Because he's he's he started in the East Coast League and now he's yeah, in yeah. the American League. Yeah, he's uh, he's been in Norfolk. He got off to a very good start. Uh, like I, I like we talked about before, Seaball. Uh, he had a tough time in junior with injuries and uh, coaching. Um, so let me get started with that. Usually what upper two say? Wait. Wait, 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 a Bertuzzi having an issue with a coach? <laughs> Usually when I open my mouth, I get in trouble. So let's try not to get me in trouble, okay? But, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it's been an interesting start. But he went to Norfolk, and he's off to a fantastic start. He's leading their team in scoring. And then uh, oh, nice. they get called up with Charlotte. And he's played one game. He's been healthy for the last three. But it's a great learning experience for him. I told him, I said, you go in the stands, you watch. Sometimes – Watching is the best tool for a hockey player to learn uh, how the game's played, especially at the different levels. And like I said, he's, uh, I told him it's a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, he's got a lot of time left. He's 21. So uh, good hockey player playing well. And I got it back and I'm looking forward to see uh, what's next for him. Awesome. Has he managed to stay pretty healthy this year, Big Bird? Uh, yeah, he's been healthy the whole entire time. You know what, uh, awesome. Tommy? I, I, spent, I spent the summer. I took the summer off too uh, to train him. I said uh, we're going back to old school training. Uh, he was with uh, a little bit of training late, uh, earlier on. I think sometimes training gets technical instead of doing old school training. Uh, the way I train was always speed and speed and speed. As a guy who's six three two forty, uh, I thought I was decently quick, but you always had to be faster each and every year. So I spent a lot of time with him. Got him from two twenty down to two hundred four. We did old school in the woods, training, sprinting, and uh, paying off. Speaking of training, actually, this kind of rung something in my head, Big Bird, and I think we've talked about it before, but like one of the most impressive things about like your career, I think, in my opinion, I'm a bigger guy too, and I, I could never do this, but like when you played in Vancouver, you were you were weighing in at what, 250? Yeah, I was uh, 250 for majority of the time until my back started getting bad, and I had to get down to 225 near the end. Didn't you? Yeah, didn't so the, you step the scales? Hey, just quickly, did you not step yeah. the scales in camp in Vancouver one year at two sixty five? No, that's with equipment on. See, ball. Oh, okay, all right, with, with gear. <laughs> that's with equipment on. Sometimes okay. we had coaching staff that wanted to see what we looked like with our equipment on, so that might have been that number. Okay, all right. <laughs> so, what kind of training did you do, Big Bird? So, like, then the lockout hits. So, I mean, yeah. you're in Vancouver weighing in about 250 pounds, dominating, yeah. lockout hits, rules change, everybody kind of realized, you know, we all have to get, you know, especially bigger guys have to get a little quicker somehow. Yeah. Like, what were you yeah. doing? Because then you showed up, like, how the following year after the lockout, what were you weighing in at? What did you do to get there? Because I think it's Yeah, amazing. I got, yeah, near the end, I got down about 225, 230. Kami, it was uh, just a lot of going on the computer, learning about speed. I did a lot of track work, a lot of football drills where I thought that if I can get my first two, three steps quicker uh, with the new rules going and all that, with my strengths and, and uh, my positioning and how I have one hand on my stick, my technical work in the corners and all that, that I think that uh, getting a little bit quicker, I can use to my advantage. And uh, so basically I just did a lot of investigating on my own. I trained myself my whole entire career. I had a gym in Kitchener that I built myself, and uh, I did a lot on my own. I had a trainer for a little while, Jeff Mazlanka, who helped me with a lot of uh, the track stuff and all that. But basically, played a lot of badminton, did a lot of quick feet, uh, ran the ski hills often. Uh, I put a lot of time and effort and work into working on my craft because I knew with my size and the way the league was going that I needed, 
I need to figure out some advantages for myself in order to uh, continue to get better. When we talk about great players who could play with just one hand on their stick, Kami, Bert's got to be top five all time. <laughs> top five. Top one. <laughs> Holy hey, one. By the way, by, 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 by the by the way, that almost never happened because I was in junior in Guelph with a guy named Bill LaForge at the Guelph Storm. And uh I drove a lot of coaches crazy, but the one thing that I always did, I always tried to work on things. And I thought for me, playing with a shorter stick, uh my advantage would be technical stuff, how to be able to cut around the net, uh hold guys off, how to spin them, how to open my legs up. Everything was with one hand. I used to practice the whole time receiving passes on my backhand, slap shot passes with one hand. So then I'm prepared in games that if, if, if my speed isn't where it needs to be, I'm able to get body position on defensemen to get around them and all that. But I remember Bill of Forge one day came over and taped both my hands on my stick. For a two-hour practice, I had tape on both hands like this, and I wasn't allowed to take them off. Picture that. For two hours, I had to skate with two hands. When all I did was one hand on my stick. But, uh, yeah, I drove a lot of coaches crazy. I was one of those players that always wanted to be creative, try things, do things in practice, entertain myself. I'm a very simple-minded guy. I needed to be entertained at all times to keep my mind on the game. But I was doing a lot of the stuff that these kids are doing now. And I really hope that the coaches now allow these kids the freedom and the creativity in order to elevate this game and these players. Like I look back and then I would have loved to have done a lot of the stuff that they're doing, but Tommy, you guys know how it is, man. The one time you try one thing, you're parked on the bench and you ain't getting it oh. off. The next thing you know, you're in a wrestling match in Minnesota with Mark Crawford and you're not happy because you got benched. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, wrestling say, match. Can, you, can you imagine just throwing a puck over to a kid and warm up in 2000 or 1997? You'd sit for a week and a half. All right, Andrew, it was always, even the stuff, like I would love to go down on two and one and pretend backhand, go between my <laughs> legs and throw a backhand sauce at the other guy going down there. I'd come back and the coaches are blowing the whistle, angry as heck. That's why I'm so stoked how the game's being played right now. And, and I hear torts blasting a lot of these guys about being creative. Come on, man, it's time to, time to change, time to evolve. Our sport is entertaining. Let these kids be as entertaining. That's why I love watching Zegras. This kid is absolutely yeah. filthy. Uh, his penalty shots, how he's coming down. That's why everyone was like, why am I always going slow? I wasn't going slow because I'm slow. I was going to try to change things up with the goaltenders. After times with penalty shots and shootouts and, and, uh, and uh, the goaltenders uh, learning about the penalty shot guy and, and the shooters, he had to be changing things up in order to, uh, to score and be entertaining. And I thought that the game always should be entertaining first, and that's what sells tickets. How does your game, you know, when I, th your game at one point, you're the most dominant power forward in the game at a time where people could still kind of basically climb on your back and, you know, get piggybacked by you up and down the ice, right? I mean, how do you think that th those prime years for you would translate into today's NHL where skills like Razor, your point about, you know, you'd, you'd get in shit for flipping a puck into the crowd for a fan or something like that. Like, how would your skills translate? from your peak years into say today's national hockey league? Well, I think with the freedom of not being tackled or, or jumped on and, uh, and having more time and space, I think, I think I was built for this generation that's going on right now. I always thought that, that my mind was creative enough that I could do things and try things, but at the same time, I will never give up the era that I played and it was the most badass era in the entire world. The names that I could list from 93 all the way to 2014 is some of the most <laughs> badass hockey players that ever played around. And they're from Mario Lemieux to Wayne Gretzky to the Talkets to, man, Sandy McCarthy's to Rocky Thompson to Donald Bashir to the Brad Mays to the Mike Commoners, all you guys, man. It was, it was the most scariest, badass era. And I'm so thrilled and excited that I was part of that and I survived it. Who scared you? Kind of. Who's who scared you? Oh, it's on a nightly basis. Like when you come out, I remember <laughs> my first training camp. Uh, remember, I'm a big dude. I'm not a heavyweight fighter. I'll yeah. stick up for my teammates. I'll fight for myself, but I would never class myself as a fighter. I just did what I needed to do uh, to create space. I played on the edge. 
I made sure that everyone know that I was always there and I would always take a run at you. So I think that's how I created my space. But I remember training camp in uh, Kitchener, my first one with the Islanders, and uh, Mike Milbury brought in every tough guy that you can possibly think of uh, to come into camp. And he thought that it was a team that he needed to build around toughness. And so you had guys squaring off at camp. I remember sitting on the bench, just shit in my pants. I'm like, oh boy, someone definitely is going to call me out and I'm going to have to get into this. <laughs> and then here it goes. But uh, man, it was like, uh, and one of my favorite guys, Nick Makota was at, at that camp. Uh, oh. We had the Richie Pinos. We had, we just, it, I, I just saw so many things go on in that era. That was, uh, that was amazing. And I was like, from playing at uh, in, in Tampa Bay at the baseball thing and then having Enrico Ciccone on that team running around with the different guys you can list, the Tony Twist, the Kelly Chase is like, you can go through the list. Sometimes that's, I look back scary. at the pictures of some of my team. Like, I'll tell you my one team in Vancouver, which was the most scariest team I've ever seen in my entire life. You had Gina Ojek, you had Donald <laughs> Brashear, you had Brad May, you Ooh. had, uh, like, uh, who else was on there? Mary Barron, you had... <sighs> Just uh, Mike Keen, like you got you you had from top heavy to middle heavy. Mind you, we never played well or made the playoffs, but it was sure entertaining. Scotty Walker was there, Steve Steos was there, myself, Brian McCabe. I just look back at a lot of the photos sometimes. And actually, the other day I was on a on a chat with uh, Horkoff, Bear, and uh, Brian Smolinski, and Smoke sent a picture of one of our Long Island teams. And wow, did that ever open my eyes. I forgot about some of the guys I played there. Kirk Muller, Matthew Schneider, Wendell Clark, Ron Hextall. Like just the guys that Derek King, wow. Pat Flatley. Like I crossed a lot of what I considered legendary players that actually taught me the game on and off the ice and how to be a professional and how to respect the game and, and play it the right way. Big Burke, stand back in those days. I was going through your career here today just to refresh my memory. And something popped out of me. I forgot about it. Um, so you, your first year, your rookie year, you spend the whole year. You have a good year on the island. You have like 18 goals. The next year, you play 13 or 15 games in Utah. And the rest of the Ooh. year, you, that I forgot about that. And then I clicked it, and I Ray Whitney was on the team. So I messaged Ray. I'm like, you played with Big Bird in Utah? He's like, yeah, neither one of us should have been there, but we had a good time. As soon as I saw that, like, what happened there? How did you end up in, like, something with Milbury? Yeah. Or how did you end yeah. up in Utah? <laughs> Yeah. Um, first of all, I needed to go down because the first year I played well, I'm with Ziggy Palpy and Travis Green. But for some reason, Mike Milbury didn't think that uh, I was tough enough, that I need to be fighting more often or, or playing more physical. So okay. I wasn't given the same opportunity that I was. I was on the first line my first year. Now I'm on the third line playing a role that I wasn't uh, not comfortable with, but I never played or whatever. So uh after i think it was maybe a month and a half i walked in and i said uh hey listen this isn't this isn't working out me and mike had a tough relationship like i'm a forgiving dude there was shit that happened to me back then in those times with with with, with, with mike that just it probably shouldn't have happened and i i would actually think that he would say the same thing but whatever i don't even care it happened and actually made me a better man and and person and understand different things but i asked for a trade so he said okay leave the office and i'll see what i can do and then uh the secretary ginger called me back into the room five minutes later and he got me traded i was like holy smokes in five minutes i just got traded he goes yep yeah, just got traded to the utah grizzlies he goes pack your shit and go down and have some fun down there fucker i was like oh boy where's utah what utah. <laughs> What, di what division are they in? Are they in the Atlantic, the Norris? I was like, Old oh, Norris shit, division. I'm going, to, I'm going to the IHL. I'm like, holy shit. So I'm like, but, but I was fortunate enough that I went down with Mick Lakota. Mick Lakota took me down there, and I think Gord Deneen was coming down with us too. So I went with two heavy hitter veterans that uh, we had some long flights to get into Utah and just talking to them and, and learning about it. But it didn't go that way. I went down. And got to my hotel room within maybe an hour. Get in my hotel room. I got called back up. Oh, so I was like, Jesus. shit! I got down there. Now I got to get back up. So I flew back into Philadelphia. <clears throat> I was a healthy scratch. Then we took the bus back to Long Island. And then after getting off the bus, I think one in the morning, Mike said I got sent down again. So the next morning, <laughs> I had to fly down to Utah. So I fly back down to Utah. 
and I get a practice in. And then I got called back up the next day to New Jersey. So then I get to New oh Jersey and uh, I'm a healthy scratch again. Oh my God. And then we oh take the bus God. to Long Island. I get sent back down. And then I was fortunate to stay down there, play 13 games. And then uh, one of the biggest life changing trades happened for me where uh, I got traded to Vancouver. I felt bad at the time because I had to take my boy, Brian McKay with me who loved Long Island. He was a captain there. And I felt like crap, even though I think at the time it was really about Brian, Brian was the top guy who ended up making that trade happen. I was, don't know if I was a throw-in or what I was, but it was life-changing for me. And uh, I was fortunate that I landed in Vancouver. And I landed with one of the greatest coaches and uh, men that I ever played with, experienced, and have a friendship with is uh, Mike Keenan. So there's a lot of people that will sit there and have nothing good to say about Iron Mike. And then, yeah. there, are, then there are some Iron Mike disciples. Yeah. Why? Why did it well, work for you? See, 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 ball goes. It goes uh, with any player you have. You have half the guys that like the coach, half that don't. Why do you like them? Because he gave you an opportunity and he played you a shitload. Why don't you like him? I don't know. He didn't like you. <laughs> he didn't play you. You sat on the bench. You're a healthy scratch. So it's like a fifty-fifty when you're coming into a team, whether your coach likes you or not. And it's so unfortunate. I know you two on the screen can understand this that a coach has the power in order to make you or break you. And it's hard that they have that kind of power over you, but that's just, that's what our sport is. Uh, we've accepted it signing that deal, but it really sucks sometimes because I saw a lot of really, really good hockey players that I thought could play just get absolutely buried because there wasn't a chemistry between the player and the coach. And it's unfortunate, but I had that with Mike and then, um, Mark Crawford came in, and uh, we are like oil and vinegar. We just didn't. But, but at the same time, I thought he was a very good coach because he played the shit out of me. So if I could, <laughs> I could, I could, I could, I could take my guy, anger guy. and my frustration out on another way, but he played the shit out of me. This guy was playing me 20 to 24 minutes uh, at my size in that kind of era where you got to – you got to carry people around and, and, and just the way it was. And, and then obviously uh, uh, form that line with the West Coast Express with uh, Nazi and Mo. And uh, uh, the rest is history with that. We had, uh, we had a lot of good, good, fun times. Hockey was fun then. Well, you, I, you, I, I, you, you touch yeah. on, you touch on Vancouver and, and, and Razor, you were in Vancouver as well. And, you know, you've kind of joked on it in prior episodes where, you had a good experience because, you know, you were riding shotgun with Luongo and, you know, everybody wants the backup in Vancouver. But there's a lot of people, a lot of players that will look at Vancouver and say, man, I don't want any part of that. But you guys both have, I think it's fair to say, great experiences. Like, Bert, it's probably a bizarre world for you where I think you go into a lot of barns and it's like, oh, here's big bad Todd Bertuzzi. Yeah. Where you go into Vancouver yeah. and you're a rock star. Uh, Andrew can thank me for that because I sent Lalongo over there, so no problem. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, every, it. Every, everyone, everyone forgets. Like, yeah, everyone forgets. Hey, I actually helped the organization too in the end. Hey, I brought Lalongo back to you guys. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, B Vancouver, Vancouver, Vancouver was awesome. Seaball, I got to meet you, uh, Dan Murphy, uh, a lot of very, very good media people. And remember, um, back in that era, you're either loved or you're hated. So it's like being a super villain. What do you want to be? Are you on the good side or are you on the bad side? I was like, I always wanted to be on the bad side, <laughs> but I've, but trying to find that happy medium being loved and hated at the same time, uh, it drove me. And I know a lot of media didn't like me or care for me out there, but it was just my way of, um, it was my way of being a hockey player. That's what motivated, uh, motivated me to go play. I love going to the other ranks and everyone absolutely hating you, but being, Loved in GM place was one of the greatest things because we had the greatest fans over there. Like, like I said, some of my fondest, best hockey memories and the most fun I've ever had in hockey was uh, those two, three, four years in Vancouver. And uh, we really shook the, uh, that arena uh, with our style of play. It was, it was when uh, we started playing globe trotting when there was a lot of snail hockey being played. And I think that was the funnest thing. And I, I always say this, that uh, the fact that we'd have the Eastern Toronto fans paying attention to our team and our team was center of attention. It wasn't the Maple Leafs was one of the 
one of the coolest things I could say uh, we accomplished. West Coast. Hey, Bert, West. I want to say this. If, if you were a throw-in in that trade, that is the greatest fucking throw-in ever in the <laughs> NHL history. <laughs> Anytime I – I want to go on record saying this. You know, I, I get a lot of – I mean, I got traded a million times and bought out and signed and moved every which way possible, and I always get questions, you know, going around on, you know, yeah. who's – great players and and i'll tell you what one name that i always bring up and one of the most amazing and i know you don't like hearing this and you're a humble dude but anytime it comes up about amazing players i thought you were one of the most if right up there uh one of the most amazing players that i ever played with or against not only a treat to play with as a teammate but playing against i thought what you did and i touched on it earlier on like how you played in vancouver and how you kind of I don't know if transformed your game is right, but mm. you know, lost weight, got faster. I mean, people I think forget about your like your hands and your vision. And anyways, I don't want to kiss your ass too much, but I always say, hey, Todd Bertuzzi was a fucking amazing player. And people tell me, forget. tell me, you already know I got a big head. You just made it even bigger. <laughs> there we go. Green. Perfect. <laughs> the love, oh, hey, no listen, big, we can't put it in any golf hat in the summers. <laughs> oh, I need to piggyback it though. I, I want to piggyback it a little bit and bring it back even a little bit further. Cause I came in the league 2000. So uh, again, like uh, a six foot, 165 pound goaltender uh, and being scared of, of Bert and his talent. And it is just his physical presence. It's funny to hear you talk about everyone else in the league, but it was dominant because of your skill, but I'm going all the way back to 93, 94, 95, when the Guelph Storm Circus with Big Bird and Jeff O'Neill, that team yeah. came to came to play the Belleville Bulls. I'm 13, 14 years old watching. It was no one dominated the game like Todd Bertuzzi did. I, I, I cannot express it enough. Watching all of those OHL, the old legendary OHL players play and come through Belleville, there was nothing. It was Eric Lindros and then it was Todd Bertuzzi. That's what the OHL was. That it was. Bert, it was unbelievable, and I was always scared of you. Just watching you from '94 in the in Guelph. And I'm, I'm, I'm very humble. I'm, I'm very humbled. Yeah, I'm. I'm humbled that you uh, you say that. And I appreciate it very much. That Bell Bowl series that we played in the oh. in the playoffs. Uh, it was a young Dan Cleary who thought he was a That's star, right. and I had to yeah. come in and smack him around a little bit. <laughs> That's uh, right. Yeah, the new was, feed, yeah, and then Danny was, came in. It was oh my god, yeah. you guys. It was awesome. The they had they had Richard Park, they had Seacorn, Craig, Mill, yeah, remember, Craig Mills, I, yeah, yeah. Craig Mills, Corey Cooper, uh, the defenseman, yeah. they had a defenseman that had to go against Radam Bachanik, Radam Bachanik, Sean Brown, Sean Brown, Sean Brown, Sean Brown, Brown. Yeah. Yeah. Boston yeah. Bruin, yeah, yeah, no, I remember that series. That was uh, that was a heck of a ride. Uh, you know what? That's a, uh, another team that we should have won. We ended up losing to uh, the Detroit Ambassadors uh in the finals in uh, i think six or seven games to todd harvey and that whole crew over there but no that was a run we had some good guy room and uh ken belanger we had uh we had some big tough boys and uh junior was fun <laughs> junior was definitely fun <laughs> no kidding <laughs> well and, and then was. dan, dan cluche was a late pickup too with that team was he not yeah, Kluch... yeah, yeah. Kluch, Kluch came over, and then I was fortunate to be a teammate with him at Vancouver, and I, I love that man. Um, I wouldn't have wanted another goaltender in my entire life uh, backing my team up, and that guy's the ultimate uh, competitor. Uh, I know there's times where he takes a little bit of heat and for uh, for for some things or whatever, but it's, it's unfortunate. The heat should have came on the top guys that didn't put the puck in the net enough. And uh, that's what I'm saying. The Vancouver stuff is a little bit better sweet. We had uh, teams that should have accomplished a little bit more. It's unfortunate, but I can't sit here and, uh, and piss over it anymore. Too many years have gone by that uh, the old mind's starting to forget. So it's okay. Uh, Ra Razor, you touch on that, that Guelph Storm team. I, I just wonder who would have got a friggin' word in beyond O-Dog and Bert. Like, <laughs> the two mouthpieces... <laughs> It was Think about the it confidence was in those two oh, teenagers. Oh, Think of the confidence. Oh, Dog's, oh, Dog's getting paid seven sheets for that mouth now, so he's doing okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah no kidding. Oh, he'll you know, tell you too. <laughs> I worked. I worked with Jeff, and I worked together at TSN when he first was breaking in, and and he's been a phenomenal talent from broadcasting standpoint. But yeah. man, I tell you, he was the only player in junior hockey when I used to cover the Ottawa 67s and the Guelph Storm came to town. The only player in junior hockey to turn me down for an interview. 
<laughs> hey, 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 by the way, everyone forgets how filthy he is Jeff because he's, he's, he's making a lot with his mouth right now. Yeah, he was a filthy, filthy hockey player. Like he was he unbelievable. Made he made yeah. all star teams. He scored forty five goals in Carolina. The guy's the guy was a competitor, especially being for his size, that skinny. And he came in like, like almost like a McDavid Blake with the Gulf Storm. He was that next uh, coming, and he lived up to. Uh, a lot of it. it's unfortunate that uh, I thought he could have. I uh, was hoping he could have played a little bit more, but phenomenal career and good dude, and he's doing a fantastic job promoting our sport and actually just yes. telling the honest truth about everything. The problem is you can't tell the truth anymore because you're getting shit. Well, he's but, he's a nat- uh, he but he's a, a natural job. heel. He's a natural. Yeah. He's a natural heel. Like he's just he's always been a confident, like arrogant. <laughs> you know, and I like Jeff a lot, and that's what makes yeah. him so good on the air is that. There's an arrogance about him, and he's very direct and very blunt. Some people don't like that, but that's what makes yeah, him so good it. on the airwaves and why he makes so much money doing what he does. But, uh, oh, my God, those two guys. just I still will never forget. Jeff, can I get an interview? Not right now. <laughs> yeah. like, really? well, hey, I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. Another reason I would have scored more goals, too, if it wasn't for towards in Nashville complaining and making a rule come in that I wasn't allowed to be stronger than the other guy to push off and continue to score those backdoor tap and uh, goals on the power play where they actually instituted that rule that you can no longer push off. And Kami, you as a defenseman, Razor, you as a goaltender, you know how it was in front of the net, man. Those were absolute <laughs> gong show wars yeah, like I've never wars. seen it before. It's like two lumberjacks just swing, goaltender hitting you in the nuts <laughs> from behind. It was like <laughs> some of the most ultimate battles and fun <laughs> things I've ever gone through. But just to be able to uh, learn how to be able to create space and room for myself and then towards the Nashville end up ruining it for me. And then slowly went from 25 power play goals to 10 and a lot of minors. <laughs> <laughs> the original green jacket, right, Todd? <laughs> you call me talked about that. That's the worst stat in the world. I think it's sometimes I told Tommy the other day, he said, he sent a clip or whatever from you guys. I said, plus minus, I got to tell you, man, I remember Detroit. I was plus 11 after maybe 15 games, and I ended the season minus 20. How does that possibly happen? (laughs) And I'm in Detroit on the most defensive team. It's one of those things where, man, you can get caught in a rut where you can just bang off 11 minuses in a row. And by the way, I'm a team player, but I sure the hell had my defenseman up top. I didn't get beat down low. Sorry, I love handing out the green jacket. I do. I think it's funny, but I it's my favorite thing more. you do. I love oh, it. Every, every I time love you send it. it out, I send you. I said, "Big Red, I love you, man. Keep this going." <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, because I'm looking at that list and I'm like, man, some of these guys are just getting fucked, and it makes it just makes me. It is a stupid stat. I agree with you, Big Bird. <laughs> hey, but you know, hey, one of my favorite things, though, Tommy. I ended my career minus forty four. So, yeah, shit happened. <laughs> Hey, we've been going down memory lane with Todd Bertuzzi here on the Clearing the Crease podcast. You know, Andrew, you talk about that that stacked Guelph Storm team. You know, Todd, you know, one of the defining series, I think, for you watching you against St. Louis with Vancouver going back, I think it was 2003, and you look at how good that Blues team, you, you know, you talk about an underachieving group in a lot of ways, you know, how they didn't win more, but Pronger, McKinnis, you know, Kachuk yeah. up front, Barrett Jackman, a young defenseman at that point in time. Uh, and, and the battles that you would have with Pronger, and I'd be curious. You went through a list of names that you had a chance to play with. <clears throat> and yeah. Who who was the best player you ever faced? Well, I will say for for that series, and I hate the fact that it happened because I don't want to see guys get hurt and all that. But I ended up hitting Al in the corner and hurting his shoulder, and then end up yeah, separated Barrett. his shoulder, right? Yeah, and the same thing happened to Barrett too. And I'm I, I, Barrett's Barrett's a good freaking dude. Love the guy, and we became. Uh, uh, friends afterwards and all that kind of stuff. But that was the t- turning point in uh, that series to be able to come back. But uh, I got to be honest, um, for me, it was always freaking, I got to play with him and I saw it firsthand. It was Nick Lipstrom, man. It, Nick was, he was impossible to hit. And I would take runs and runs and runs at him like you couldn't believe. I couldn't get a pass, pass to stick on any two on one, three on twos. And it was just his body position in the in, in his gap with me. I wanted the big dudes to come in as fast as they can. I always thought I could out muscle the bigger guys with my leverage and and working on my techniques and how to spin off. But 
Nick gave me the most fits. It, it was it was the big physical guys that uh, I would say I had success with because I thought that I could outpower them. Maybe not all the time, but like the Dano Chars, those kind of guys. Like when they were in my face and they weren't giving me any time and space, and and it and and a lot of times it freed up a lot of my other guys because I'd have him the sentiment coming down trying to over. Uh, match me, empower me, and it gave a lot of time and space for Nazi and Mo. Uh, so it was something that I worked on. But I would have to say Nick. Nick, Nick was Nick was extremely hard to play against. Um, and then playing with him, seeing it firsthand, one of the greatest, greatest, if not the greatest. Obviously, uh, I'm an historian, Bobby Orr. But I'll tell you right now, <laughs> Nick is uh, Nick is right there, if not right beside or or uh, pretty darn close. So it was uh, impressive seeing it firsthand and his leadership and uh, his composure and just how he came to the rink every day as a professional. was uh, It was fun to watch and play with. Thanks for this. I know we uh, said we, I feel yeah. like we could probably uh, go all day because we really just scratched the surface, but uh, nice to see you again. Uh, can you come yeah. back? Would you, would you do it again sometime? Would you come back and visit? I'm, uh, yeah, I told Kami I'm going to come up to uh, see Kami one day and I'm going to come sit in with you guys with Kami. I haven't seen Kami yes. in a while. It's the time we uh, been way too in long. Me watch Kami hit some bombs, but you guys are doing a fa- fantastic job. Keep uh, promoting the game. And, and uh, like I said, uh, I enjoy listening to you guys and uh, keep up the good work and uh, appreciate you guys. And when you well, come back. Thanks for coming on, Big Bert. Seriously, mm-hmm. we appreciate yeah, it. And, yeah, and when sure. you come back, Bert, when I told you that we were doing this show together with uh, with Ray sure. Croft and Kami, you did mm-hmm. say, I will have to share the story about the time I had to truck Kami back to his hotel room in Newfoundland. So we will save that. Oh, <laughs> Okay. Well, let's save that for the next one. That's still the 44 oh, tow truck. <laughs> I didn't, oh, I didn't man. Pull Thank them. you for I doing that, them. Bert. Oh, my God. Tommy, <laughs> you know, I, I, I always got your back, buddy. I appreciate <laughs> it. I really needed it that night. Thanks, Bert. <laughs> All right. I hey, love Bert. you guys. You guys be good. See there you there boys. he is. Yeah. Much love to Todd Bertuzzi joining us here on the Clearing the Crease podcast. Well, lots of fun with uh, Todd Bertuzzi here on the Clearing the Crease podcast. And Sabalski, Raycroft, Commodore hanging out with you. We love to offer each and every week our good friends at Bodog, always serving up a chance to win a brand spanking new of your choice NHL jersey courtesy of our friends at Bodog. And all you got to do is reply to this video wherever you're watching, whether it's at Bodog CA on YouTube, on Instagram. Uh, and hey, we just want to hear from you. Send us a question, whether it's directed to Razor, whether it's to Kami, whether it's to Seaball right here or to all three of us. And if we pick your question, you win a free NHL jersey courtesy of Bodog. This week's winner is at Expos Habs from Laval, Quebec. And he is wondering, or she is wondering, um, should the Habs trade Josh Anderson? Which team would be a good fit and what would they get for him? Kami, you want to start with this one? Yeah, sure. I'll start with this one. Uh, um, Should they trade them or trade Josh? Sorry. No, I don't think I would. I really like Josh Anderson. Uh, I think he would be a player that's hard to replace. Uh, Being completely honest, I haven't seen a Canadians game in a little while, so I'm not sure. I know he's got like nine goals. He's not doesn't have a bunch of points, but I think replacing a guy like that is really tough. So if I were, he's got like three, four years left on his deal too, five and a half. I wouldn't if it was me, Um, but I do think the Canadians are looking into it. I feel like you could get a ton as far as who would want him. I think there would be a a lot of teams that would want somebody like him. Uh, He can score. He's big. He can move. He's got a little grit to him. Um, I really like him as a player. So if I'm Montreal, I don't. Um, But if they do, I'd love to be on the receiving end of that. Andrew, yeah, I go, I go right to to the the, the last little bit of part of Kami's comment in that there, there's someone's gonna give a haul for him. He's that Nick Paul kind of guy that you one of these great teams that we're talking about plugs him into a third line, second line opportunity, and he runs with it and makes a forward group that much better. And, and I think we we talked about the arms race earlier on. It feels like this is a year that Josh Anderson would be a guy that someone would throw half of their organization at to get. 
more so than someone else because he is that valuable. Uh, it, Kami's point, he's a perfect guy to have around young guys. He's a perfect guy in Montreal to start rebuilding with because he is a, a culture guy. He does plays the game the right way, wants to do the things the right way. But I just think at the end of the day, one of these teams is going to throw a lot at Montreal and it gets to a point where they, they have to move on from it. But you want a guy like that on your team. And I, and I think that's why one of these um, perennial favorites is going to take a run at. Well, you still got term at what, what five and a half per year or so for another four years. And he's, he's 28 right now. He'll be 29 in the summer. Um, you know, I guess it depends on what version of Josh Anderson you're getting, right? I, I think if you were to prorate his numbers over the last couple of years, he's he's pretty much shown he's a 20 goal scorer. I mean, COVID obviously, you know, ended the one season a couple of years ago. Um, last year he had what 19, I think, in 69 games. So, you know, if he if he factors into those 13 games, he's pretty much a 20 goal scorer. You know, I think sometimes the knock on on and Kami, you can probably speak to this better as a guy who is six four, but kind of the big power forward they're kind of knocked sometimes for being in a malaise right you know you're, you're kind of well why can't you dominate every night and i feel like our guest todd bertuzzi would have been a great example to, to talk about this but you know i remember talking about this with todd years ago it is really hard as a power forward to dominate and bang and crash every night you know to, to be that sort of physical presence when you're that size um, but he does check a lot of boxes and in the sort of Tom Wilson unicorn era, you know, Josh Anderson kind of fits that mold, but Kami, it, it is tough to be that sort of dominant power forward on a nightly basis. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would definitely think so. I mean, there's a lot of games. I mean, I, I would say, yeah, you no, know, you have to pick your spots a little bit. I mean, you can't just be running around smoking everything that moves for 82 games straight and expect to have something left for the playoffs. So yeah, I mean, I guess pick your spots a little bit in today's game. I mean, you can, there aren't, you know, there's not going to be every game where you're going to need to run around. And like, I think you can, and I think he's, he's skilled enough where, you know, he doesn't have to do it all the time, but I, I think, I think when it would come very valuable is, is when you get in, if he gets like Razor said, if you get him on, on one of these playoff teams and now, now we're going and now we're in the playoffs and now the game gets a little bit more physical. Well, he's going to be able to handle that. He should be fine. Uh, and then he can get rolling. So uh, I really like him as a player, for sure. I, I like the idea. I, I guess unless it's an offer you can't refuse. I mean, yeah. I think the rebuild seems to be accelerated in Montreal where, you know, Suzuki is, he's a primetime player, right? I mean, Cole mm -hmm. Caulfield is a primetime player. They're not big guys. So you want, I think, a sort of physical element to be there and, you know, allow for that accountability. I guess it's what the future lies in goal for Montreal and whether they can continue to accelerate the rebuild. But I think while you still have term, unless it's an offer you can't refuse to channel my, channel my inner Don Corleone, I'm staying the course. I don't think I'm making that move. So thanks very yeah. much for the question at Expos Habs. You won yourself a brand new jersey courtesy of our friends here at Bodog. Speaking of Bodog, if you're looking for a sports book for your NHL action this season, new customers get a $400 welcome bonus when you sign up today. Bodog offering props on pretty much anything from same game parlays to uh, number of fights and number of goal scorers, uh, goal score picks. And if you're listening, you're an existing Bodog player. Hey, you can still get in on the action as well because all players get a $300 match bonus when you deposit with Bitcoin for the first time. Link is in the bio or wherever you are watching or listening to this podcast. So you can get in on all the action on the road to the Super Bowl. Yeah, it's Super Bowl season all month long. We've got you covered here at Bodog with all props, game lines, futures from now until the big game is played and beyond. There is no flag when you score on a big play with Bodog. And that's what we'll, uh, on that note, we will wrap it up for this week's edition of the Clearing the Crease podcast. He is Andrew Raycroft. He's Mike Commodore. Uh, Kami, no more outdoor games for you for the next little bit. No more outdoor. No, no, I'm no, gonna... no, you're not playing. No, Razor, no actually, that was supposed game. to be directed at you. I am off to a wonderful yeah, start you, here. With actually, this, uh, I do have an outdoor game coming. My first one ever, I think. If they really? keep the invitation, I think I'm in. It's not confirmed yet, 
but I think I'm going to get to play in an outdoor game in Carolina. I got to start <laughs> skating. You yes. better get skating. There's going to be a lot of people there skating. watching. You better. Yeah, I got to get moving. Better get yeah. moving. I'm off the sauce, like not totally off, but I'm going to cut it back. I'm going to yep. get my gear. And I want to be ready to go on February 18th or whatever day of the game. You're going to be alumni counted game. on. You're a young guy. You're going to be counted on in me. that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Razor, that did you skate happen. on that? Did you skate at Fenway? I, I do. Uh, not yet. I will, though. I We're doing a little alumni fantasy day uh, here in Boston. So I, I've got that. I'm going. I'm jumping out on Wednesday. Bring an umbrella awesome. here. I, yeah, I know. That's the issue. <laughs> <laughs> be happy soaking wet it won't be sweat <laughs> there we go uh happy new year everybody thanks so much for uh for staying with us here and we will see you in a couple of weeks right here on the clearing the crease podcast powered by bodog